Okay, so good afternoon, everybody. This is Paolo Pagano from the National Consortium of Telecommunications in Italy. And uh, I'm the convener of the, this webinar. Uh, it will uh, show the, uh, the plans and the results coming from the, uh, the Italian testbed of the project uh, that is named uh, Autopilot. And uh, the, uh, the agenda today is the following. Uh, uh, we, uh, we have a very short webinar introduction by me with uh, shown context and motivations. Then uh, uh, Lorenzo Pieri from AVR will uh, introduce the testbed and the use cases. Uh, then uh, the one m 2 m platform we use in the project will be shown by Telecom Italia, Paolo Scalandro will be the presenter. Uh, in turn, the vehicle features and IoT-assisted autonomous driving manoeuvres will be uh, described by the uh, Fiat Research Center, FCA group. Leandro Dorazio will be the presenter. Uh, and then finally, the uh, description of onboard units, spot all detectors, smart traffic light, algorithms uh, for pedestrian detection will be uh, presented by Daniele Brevi from uh, the Istituto Superiore Mario Boella in Turin. The final uh, uh, slot is for questions and answers. Okay, so the, uh, the objective is uh, uh, to communicate uh, to external public, of course, uh, and then uh, uh, include uh, external audience into the development of the project uh, and also to start a debate about automated driving. So the intended audience is that of uh, having research uh, stakeholders, industry stakeholders, institutions and authorities, and uh, autopilot partners. Uh, this is not optimal because it's not in slideshow. Please forgive me about it. Okay, I will uh, uh, briefly introduce the technical motivations uh, um, of the autopilot project. Then I will uh, uh, discuss uh, uh, the uh, situation in Italy that uh, is uh, moving from standard to normative. And then I will uh, uh, discuss the Italian pilot site scenario and the specifications of our pilot site. Uh, so, we, so far we have uh, in this cartoon uh, some uh, uh, sensors uh, on board of our vehicles. And uh, this is uh, providing support for automated driving by detecting obstacles and information in a range of about 100 meters. If uh, we move further, uh, vehicle and network uh, can provide additional information. This is the so-called ITS uh, uh, scope. And uh, uh, if we go uh, again out of the line of sight uh, communication, we can retrieve information from the cloud. Actually, this is the idea of the of autopilot, that uh, the cloud is providing readings uh, about uh, the internet, the, uh, about the situation uh, as uh, instantiated by the Internet of Things. And uh, uh, this will be retrieved by a, a common platform. Namely, in Italy, we are using the 1M2M standard. So this is uh, the set of sites and applications that uh, uh, are uh, considered in autopilot. So we have the Finnish, the French, the Italian, the Korean, the Dutch, and the Spanish pilot site, and uh, the Italian one, which will be described today by me and uh, by our collaborators and uh, colleagues uh, in Italy, uh, will be about the use of uh, IoT for the autonomous driving in the context of highway and also for urban driving. So the scenario where we test uh, um, all these functions uh, coming from the IoT is that of the Port of Livorno, is a very, to say, uh, interesting uh, scenario uh, because it's a, um, an industrial settlement. It's a multi-purpose uh, port uh, from the 16th century and uh, it is not the least of the European ports as it will also host the European Seaport Conference in 2019. Uh, apart from the uh, port settlement, uh, we also have a highway. Uh, it's a remarkable uh, highway connecting uh, Florence to Pisa. Uh, in the project, uh, there will also be the um, 
traffic control center uh, that uh, features a DATEX2 node integrated in the national motorways information system. And also the traffic uh, the, uh, is a, it's a very busy actually uh, highway because 40,000 vehicles per day with 20% share of AV vehicles uh, is something that ranks it uh, among the topmost uh, of the Italian scenario. And uh, we will have uh, SCG5 coverage of the highway in autopilot. Uh, last uh, picture I want to show is that uh, what we have discussed uh, uh, so far in research projects and uh, in standardization activities now turns to be normative in Italy. As uh, uh, starting from a decree that uh, has been published on April 18th, uh, we are uh, um, considering the use of autonomous driven vehicles in public roads. And this is possible only in smart roads, uh, that those featuring SCG5 uh, uh, connectivity, and upon the approval of the, uh, by the Ministry of Transportation. That's it. So I would like to stop in here and uh, give the floor to uh, engineer Lorenzo Pieri from the highway uh, company. Thank you very much, Paolo. Um, so yes, my screen should be viewable by now. Can you see my screen? Yes, I, uh, we can. Great, perfect. So I'll start the introduction. Uh, yes, perfect. Yeah, this should be it. Okay, so uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Lorenzo Pieri, as presented by Paolo Pagano. I'm part of the AVR team, and we are um, following the, the highway um, and participating in the project for the Italian pilot site, along with the other partners that are involved, uh, the first of which is uh, CNIT for the telecommunications and FCA for the automated driving cars. Um, there's also... Um, well, uh, CRF actually. There's also Instituto Mario Boella, uh, Continental Team, and Thales for the security of the site. Um, Paolo Pagano already described part of the site, so you may uh, uh, as well know that it's, um, it's a highway composed of 100 kilometers uh, uh, both way uh, the roads, and the traffic is very dense, as uh, stated. It's about 40,000 uh, vehicles per day, with 20% uh, being uh, heavy weight traffic. So um, the aspect encompasses uh, the area that goes from the port of Livorno to the Florence uh, uh, Livorno Highway. And uh, IoT devices are, in fact, deployed all along the roads in uh, both ways. Uh, with the uh, with the radius of the devices spanning throughout both uh, sides of the roads, and these devices are both installed on the highway and the urban area to test the um, the devices. Uh, Jeep Renegades prototypes were used. AVR and um, CRFs are dispo uh, are making possible for the the, the presence of a few Jeep Renegades and uh, some of which, as I said, are connected and uh, two are um, automated drive it cars. Uh, there is also a connected bicycle prototype which uh, is part of the project and is part of the um, Port of Livorno use case. And all of this uh, is, uh, is, uh, is going to work and be shown in the Monica Port Monitoring Center. Uh, to make sure that um, security is, uh, is shown and is the number one priority of this project. So to make sure that all devices are connected and work well together to establish a level of connection and uh, information that is useful to the final user and to the other devices as well that are connected, in fact, to the, um, to the shared space, which is the, the cloud in this case. So all, pretty much all information is, uh, is transferred and seen by the traffic control center, which, is, which sits in Empoli, which is halfway uh, through the highway. And um, there are two use cases. Uh, one is the highway pilot and the other one is the urban driving. 
On the highway pilot, you can find the road hazard events, uh, which are uh, briefly announced by the IoT devices and should enable IoT, uh, speed adaptation and lane change functions on the AD cars. On the connected cars, they should enable the passing of the pass through of information to make uh, to make it possible for faster decision by the user of the connected car. On the other hand, on the urban driving scenario, the vulnerable the vulnerable road user uh, is detected at a traffic light intersection and it should trigger um, a break by the AD car and the knowing of this uh, VRU on the connected car. So as to the scenario we just saw, there are two possible cases, um, but the big thing is about avoiding incidents and uh, well accidents in the real world uh, environment, which in this case, as I already said, is about uh, a highway with uh, really large traffic numbers. And the most common events are pretty much roadworks, which is why that was chosen. Uh, that was chosen and rainwater standings because uh well we are entering autumn like we, we, we entered autumn yesterday and the, the rain is coming along with the winter uh, so we have to make sure that the final user is safe and that is why uh, the use case uh, wants to make sure that these devices work correctly to pass through the information and let's see the next slide uh, on the urban case um uh, all information uh, as well as with the highway is passed through the one m2m cloud uh, which uh, uh, takes in and hands out information with uh, uh, known iot protocols which could be mqtt or uh, even http or sockets anyway um, the, there is the chance for the cloud to uh, make this information available readily and fast to the connected uh, environment and this way in the use in the urban use case there is a way to avoid accidents in the embarkment area of the cruise and ferry terminals uh, which uh, uh, has a really high number of passengers which is uh, two million passengers per year so um, in this case the tackling was about pedestrian traffic light violation uh, fallen cyclists in the intersection and pavement deformation uh, going forward uh, the devices and IoT components of the Italian pilot site, as you can see from the slide, uh, is, um, is listed right here. We have pilot IoT sensors based on both six low pan and narrow band IoT technologies, uh, pothole detection. Uh, we're working on a smart trailer to announce the roadway works uh, while, while passing, where uh, we have RSUs, uh, OBUs both on cars and bicycles. Uh, the smart traffic light, which is operated by ISMB, and the smart camera. Uh, for the network part, we use uh, four wireless backbone, um, the highway backbone, and um, which uses the Tuscanian uh, institutional cable network, LCG5, as stated previously by Paolo Pagano, and of course, narrowband and six low pan networks. Uh, the platforms which are used for the pass-through of information are, of course, the 1M2M platform on the cloud and the Invicle IoT information. Um, this is uh, an example of an interface that we're working on, which is the administration interface for the um, reliability and validation of Denim messages, which are passed through by devices and the 1M2M because uh, while using the, the DATEX2 standard protocol, the, the message and the, the actual event and situation must be validated by a human, uh, which is part of the TCC, which means that an event is geolocalized and uh, put on the map. And this event is then validated by uh, the TCC members sending someone to actually check for the event to be truthy or falsy. If the event is truthy, it is checked to be truth, and if true, it is accepted and sent to the other devices which spread the message. If not, the device, the, the denim is not validated and will be eliminated also logged. Uh, as you can see, the IoT final user services would be Monica, and in our case for the CCC, the, uh, the in administration interface for the denim which would enable the port monitoring by IoT functions for drivers and VRUs. 
putting safety in the first spot and the validation of IoT detections with DATEX format with uh, events flowing through the TCC. And that would be all. Thank you very much. Uh, let's see. I think the next speaker is Paolo Stalambro from, from Telecom Italia, who will uh, introduce you about uh, the 1M2M platform. Paolo, are you there? Paolo does not show up. Uh, we we can try. Okay, do you do you hear me? Paolo, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Do you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes. Uh, unfortunately, you are not listed uh, among the experts, but I can show the slides if you like. Okay. Uh, you circulated a few a few days ago. If they are mm -hmm. the last ones. They they are still valid. Okay. Good. Uh, if uh, Cecilia, can you let me be presenter again? Okay, good. So this is uh, this is your presentation, Paolo. If you can uh, describe the slides by yourself. Okay, this is uh, good morning. I'm Paolo Scalambro. I'm working on Icon One Machine to Machine Platform. So this is an, an overview, a general overview. You can move uh, directly to the slide four. Okay, I uh, presented here a very short overview of one machine to machine. So the main point is the team provides an instance of ICON that is a storing share platform compliant with, uh, with one machine to machine standard. But why, what is a, uh, one machine to machine standard? So uh, the name is uh, easy to understand. It's a standard for machine to machine, but uh, the, in general, one machine to machine is, is a global organization that defines a lot of things about uh, one machine to machines. Uh, that the, for example, requirements, architecture, API specification, security solution, interoperability for one machine to machine and IoT technologies. So I mean all the, the things that are um, useful for uh, this uh, matter. So the main features supported by one machine to machine standard are uh, uh, so it is a software and middle, middleware layer, a common set of function to application via API, data store and stores and share, access control, and notification about events to application. So the point is that uh, a platform compliant with one machine to machine standard is a platform of store and share, uh, and these are the main point of the standard. In the following slide, Please, you can move to the next one. Okay. In the following one, there, there are uh, the standard uh, defines uh, two uh, entities that are the application entity and common service entity. What is an application entity? Is a, a source that produces data or that reads data. So for example, in this case of uh, autopilot project, uh, source may be an OBU on, on uh, a car, or uh, an application may be a cloud application or an Apple smartphone that uh, uses uh, the, the data stored on uh, the platform. ICON is uh, the second type of entity that is a common, ser common service entity, uh, CSE, and uh, in this uh, platform provides a set of functions, for example, uh, data management and the repository, subscription and notification on events, registration, registration, security, and so on. The interface between these uh, two entities, between uh, application entity and common service entity, is called MCA reference point. In uh, this very simple uh, picture, is described uh, the, uh, uh, in the two uh, link between the platform and, for example, the cars, and with uh, uh, the application, for example, a smartphone. Okay, next one. 
Okay. Uh, what is, uh, as I told before, ICOM platform is a platform compliant with uh, the standard. And the team provides uh, this platform as a platform, as a service. That is a cloud model that provides all the infrastructure required to create and manage custom cloud applications. ICOM is uh, installed in a team self data center that is a commercial platform for Austin, managed directly by team. So uh, this, uh, a this is a platform that is uh, exposed directly on public internet at uh, this link. The original product is based on open source product that is named Ocean, and, and this uh, um, product by a Korean consortium. Okay, this, uh, in this slide are uh, reported the main features of ICOM platform. That is, of course, the compliance, the presence of southbound and northbound REST APIs for data storage and sharing, the data sharing by means of pull and push. Each resource is identified by an URI. There are um, web access console for uh, both for or for resource management and provisioning, or for also for administrator is uh, service independent. So it's, uh, there is an interworking also with the legacy platform and non one, mach one machine to machine platforms by means of uh, a layer of adaptation. Of course, uh, this platform is a multi-tenancy. So uh, a lot of tenancy can uh, use this uh, platform and each tenant uh, uh, can see only the, uh, the area reserved to his uh, tenant. Okay, next one. It's about the uh, security aspects of uh, the platform. Um, These uh, are reporting the main features that are that use uh, um, the app APIs are exposed through SSL, both uh, for HTTPS or MQTT protocol. The authorization is based on credential and uh, associated with a specific user. For example, autopilot uh, project as a specific uh, tenant of this course with a specific credential. Last but not least, there is uh, defined also, um, also by the standard one machine to machine, an access control policy, ACP, that uh, needs to be created for each application entity. In other words, an uh, access control policy defined as a, is defined as a set of conditions that determine whether entities are permitted to access a protected resource. Um, this is a high-level architecture. Uh, in the center, of course, you, there is uh, the, ocean, the platform, the ICOM platform. In the lower part of the picture, there are the source of data that can be or entity uh, one machine uh, to machine compliant or other uh, sources uh, by, via, via gateway or a legacy IoT platform that are not not one to machine machine to machine so there is as you can see an uh, adapt there are the adapter an adaptation layer that uh, converts uh, uh, the this the other protocol in uh, one machine to machine protocol also used in autopilot uh, 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 thank you uh, also used in autopilot project uh, there are also a core um, narrow band iot so there are a source of data that uh, are uh, transported by mobile network, in particular via, uh, via uh, narrowband IoT. Of course, in the upper uh, section of, of the, in the upper part of the uh, of the picture, there are applications that access to data stored on the on the platform, also via REST uh, one machine to machine API. Okay. Okay. This is a resource tree. I, the, the resource tree is the data structure uh, that uh, ICON and one machine uh, to machine standard uses uh, to um, store uh, data. Uh, as uh, I can uh, may said before, uh, for uh, there is a tenant called Autopilot, uh, and, and this is a container that con uh, this in, in this tenant there are um, uh, groups of container uh, divided uh, on the type of data. For example, uh, we I, um, I highlight the, the part about the RSU. 
and uh, there is a container that uh, store um, come messages from a vehicle and for each vehicle there is a container the container is a basic uh, element of um, for the storing data in uh, the next slide uh, we, uh, we can see um, the, um, the content instance, the, the, um, the meaning is the data that are stored for, uh, in each container. For example, about uh, the example of, of a CAM message, uh, you can see for uh, CAM vehicle number 3902, there are uh, the, a lot of content instance. It, for, from, uh, for each instance, uh, there is a CAM message, uh, message store. In the, the upper part, there are attributes and values defined and uh, added by the platform, and the lower part, there are the content that is a common message. Okay, this uh, is the last uh, slide, and uh, are uh, only described the, the um, interface supported the, uh, of, um, by uh, one machine to machine platform that I mentioned uh, also before. And uh, that are HTTP, uh, MQT, uh, that is a uh, classical protocol, web protocol, and also MQTT and uh, COAP, that is a protocol for uh, low power for uh, devices with uh, low capacity about uh, consumption. And so it's uh, the protocol very light, used uh, often in uh, the machine to machine uh, world. As I told before, also there is an adaptation layer that is fundamental to convert the non one machine to machine uh, protocol with the standard protocol supported by ICON. Thank you. Thank you, Paolo. Uh, so I think uh, after the, having described the, uh, the 1M2M platform, it's now time to describe uh, what the autonomous driven vehicles are uh, publishing on this platform and how can they can can they consume information coming from the IoT so next presenter is from uh, FCA uh, group uh, Centro di Cerche Fiat uh, engineer Leandro Grazio can you Leandro yeah, are you thanks, there thanks Paolo okay. yeah yeah thank you okay Okay. Okay, so good afternoon everyone. As uh, Paolo said, my name is Lando Dorazio and I'm working with FCA CRF. So in this presentation I give you a brief overview of technical features which have which have been implemented uh, in the prototypes of the Italian pilot site. And uh, I try also to give you an idea on how IT like, information is used uh, for automated driving maneuvers. So the presentation will be organized exactly um, to describe this content. So the first part is aimed at describing the architecture of uh, the prototypes of the Italian pilot site, both from a software and another point of view. And uh, the second part is aimed at understanding how IoT information can be used uh, to improve um, automated driving maneuvers uh, and uh, to, let's say, to provide a better user experience to the driver and a safer experience. So let's start uh, with the first part. Okay, so here you can see um, the high level architecture of the vehicles which are used in our pilot site. Uh, so now, without getting into the test, you can see that uh, there is a, let's say, um, a part which is dedicated to, to communication devices. So, so, so all uh, this part is in that uh, communicate, communicating with the uh, external world. So through, uh, let's say, to communicate with uh, other uh, vehicles, which are also connected, or the unit, uh, the cloud, and so on. Then, uh, of course, uh, this link is also used to, um, let's say, to receive uh, IoT information from outside the vehicle and to use it uh, inside the vehicle to perform automated maneuvers. Then, okay, here you can see all the sensing devices uh, which are embedded uh, in the vehicle. So the idea of these devices is uh, to understand uh, how the vehicle is performing on the road and also to detect uh, a potential obstacle uh, in front of the vehicle and uh, in general to understand uh, the surrounding environment uh, that the vehicle can, um, uh, can find on its own path. 
His uh, true information sources are then uh, used by the vehicle itself in order to understand which is the best maneuver to be performed in an automatic way, of course. And at the same uh, unit, it's also aimed at informing the, the driver to the HMI on the vehicle for possible, uh, let's say, dangerous situation or uh, any external event that uh, needs to be, uh, let's say, seen by the driver. Now, if uh, we go a little bit deeper into details, uh, you can see here uh, the software architecture which characterizes the um, Italian prototypes. Uh, so here, of course, I'm not going to details, uh, but uh, it is just to give you an overview of uh, the complexity of the software architecture that has been embedded uh, on our vehicles. Now, uh, okay, here uh, you can see some uh, components uh, that have been already discussed before. Uh, and as you can see, each, uh, let's say, macro component is, um, how to say, is characterized by more uh, sub-components that are used to, to implement some specific functionalities uh, for each module. Of course, uh, in the design phase, uh, we had to identify and uh, to think to find the interfaces among uh, all these components because, uh, as you can understand, uh, it was not so easy to have uh, such a huge, huge complexity you know, on a single vehicle, and so we need to uh, carefully design uh, every detail of uh, the architecture. So this is uh, from a software point of view. Of course, uh, the full architecture is not implemented on a single device, on a single hardware device, uh, but uh, it is distributed over uh, different devices of the car. So here, for example, you can see the hardware architecture of the connected and automated uh, driving vehicle. Now, uh, just to give a brief overview, as you can see here, we use the two dedicated uh, CAN buses uh, to share information among uh, the additional uh, devices which have been required by the autopilot architecture. Then, of course, we also have uh, the connection to the original uh, CAN bus of the vehicle, which is used uh, to, uh, to, to actuate the maneuvers that have been decided by the central uh, AD unit uh, of the vehicle. So this AD unit, uh, uh, as I said before, uses the information coming from the in-vehicle sensor, like, for example, the frontal sensor, but also from uh, the outside of the vehicle, uh, like, for example, the IoT information coming from uh, the external world or uh, the information about uh, the, the horizon, which is also fed by external information. And of course, at the end, you also have uh, the HMI, which is used to, um, to work the driver and uh, to provide information in general to the driver. So this is uh, the architecture, the hardware architecture of the connected and automated driving vehicle. And uh, we also identified a dedicated architecture for the connected vehicle. As you can see, the connected vehicle is, uh, let's, say, let's say, less complex, but of course, is uh, still important for our use cases because it provides uh, information both uh, to the cloud and is also able to receive uh, information from the cloud in order to uh, always work the driver about possible dangerous situation. So now this is uh, okay, a brief overview about uh, the architecture. In the, in the second part of the presentation, I'll give you an overview on how this information is used uh, by our vehicles. So here you can see, let's say, a breakdown of the AD unit of, uh, of our vehicle in terms of, um, from a software point of view. So as you can see, the AD unit, uh, which before was represented by a single system, it can be divided in three different modules, a perception module, a manual module, and a control module. The perception module receives information from the sensor which are embedded on the car and from the information which are coming from the external IoT. So as you can see, this, uh, all this information together is fused in order to feed the maneuver module which decides the best maneuver for the vehicle. And then uh, once uh, the maneuver has been decided, uh, this, um, okay, this information is passed to the control module, which actuates uh, the real uh, motion of the data, both in terms of the lateral and GPI control. Now, just to give you some more details about uh, which kind of information we are talking about, uh, here you can see a detailed um, breakdown of the information which are coming from outside the vehicle and uh, from uh, some of the sensors which are embedded in the vehicle. Now, if uh, the perception model is able to fuse all this information, 
and to provide as output as output a description of the scenario, which can be used uh, to understand which kind of maneuvers that they could have to perform. So once the first scenario has been uh, clearly described by the perception module, the maneuver module is then able to decide which is the best maneuver to be performed, uh, and then the maneuver is passed uh, to the vehicle for the final actuation. Okay, so this is just to give you a brief overview of the information we are talking about. Uh, now, just uh, one last slide uh, to recap uh, what uh, can can we do with uh, this architecture. So, without entering into details, uh, because Lorenzo already presented uh, some of the use cases which which uh, we are uh, implementing on our pilot site. But here you can see that uh, all the information which has been described so far, uh, the one to M one M to M platform together with the cloud. Uh, the sensor on the road, the vehicle uh, itself, uh, can give us the possibility to use IoT information coming from uh, the external world in order to, to feed the automated driving maneuvers and to perform specific use cases that uh, otherwise couldn't be implemented uh, on uh, this kind of vehicles. And uh, okay, so this is uh, my last slide. Uh, thanks uh, for your attention. Okay, thank you, Leandro. I think uh, we move to the last uh, presentation before the questions and answers session. Uh, I give the floor to Daniele Brevi from Istituto Superiore Mario Boella from Turin. Daniele, okay, thank, the floor you, is thank you very much. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay. So thank you. My name is Daniele Brevi. I work for Istituto Superiore Mario Boella, that is a non-profit private research center based in Italy. And today I want to present you how we use IoT to implement uh, the urban use cases of the Italian pilot site. So first of all, we think that uh, IoT is the base to enable local awareness, and then uh, IoT and local computation can bring uh, high benefits to automate maneuvers. This is really true for safety related services because they typically need very low delays, both considering computation and the transmission point of view, but also to enable others high value services. These are typically based on local information. And then we also have other type of services, typically in real time that will benefit of the data that uh, we are saving on the IoT platform, that is the one M2M platform described by Paolo. So this is a brief overview of our architecture for both the IoT onboard unit and the IoT roadside unit. So as you can see, the base are the IoT devices and we uh, are using uh, uh, basically inertial sensor, uh, both on car and on a bicycle. We will see in a while how. And for the roadside point of view, we are using a stereo camera to uh, perform the pedestrian detection and a traffic light to read its phases and to send them to the vehicles. Then we have the computation level. From uh, the roadside unit point of view, we have uh, the management of the IoT pedestrian detection. And then uh, we have a module to send a notification to the vehicle based on this detection and also to send the SPAT messages. All these data are sent over the G5 communication channel and are received by the onboard unit of the uh, car, but also by the onboard unit of the bicycle. And there on the onboard unit, we have uh, the computation, so the fog computation, the one very near to the real devices, where we have uh, the module to manage uh, the virtual potential sensor, and then uh, we have another module to filter relevant data. We will see in a while how. Okay, so we have uh, several actors in uh, the urban use cases, so uh, we will, I will describe you one by one, and the first is the IoT in vehicle platform. Here, as I said, we manage all the messages, the one from SCG5, the messages sent via LTE to the one m 2 m platform, but also we collect data uh, from the accelerometers using different channels like Wi-Fi or 6-low VPAN. 
And then we also perform SFOG computation. So we filter all the information and we send them to the D function only when relevant. So for example, if we are too far from the traffic light, we filter uh, the uh, sending of information to the uh, AD function. And also if we are not uh, in the direction of the traffic light, so we are, for example, only nearby the traffic light, but uh, we will not uh, pass uh, uh, towards it, we will filter this information. And then we'll, we will also aggregate and analyze uh, accelerometers to create a virtual sensor view but I will describe this later in more detail. Then we have the smart traffic light with the pedestrian detection module. So here you can see a picture done in Livorno during our experimentation. So we have the roadside unit, a stereo camera for the pedestrian detection and the Wi-Fi connectivity provided by CNIT to connect to the 1 and 2M platform. And here you can see a picture of our hardware. So we have the GPS and the CG5 module, the traffic light that is connected with a normal USB connection, and then the CPU and GPU that are used to manage the camera. So the main function of the smart traffic light is for sure the pedestrian detection. And here we have used a well-known algorithm called the histogram of oriented gradients that it's quite famous. And uh, it is also included in the well-known OpenCV library. So the limitation that we have uh, found in the first experimentation with this type of algorithm are the following. So it is computationally expensive. So for this reason, we need a GPU to work in real time. Otherwise, we cannot uh, detect and send information in time to the autonomous vehicle. And uh, we find also that uh, there are many variables that can change the performance of this algorithm also in a significant manner. So it's quite difficult to generalize it for every situation. Also, abstraction can be a problem. So it's not too easy to find the best point of view and here we have to find also a trade-off between false positive and false negative so let's see what this means so for example in this first picture we have one true positive and two false negatives so this is uh, quite uh, a dangerous situation because uh, uh, for example if the first pedestrian goes very fast i have uh, the last two pedestrian that are not detected by our algorithm. So in this case, I can have a situation, a dangerous situation where the automated maneuvers cannot see the pedestrian. But if I change my parameters in order to have less false negative, I can have more false positive. So as you can see here, the light condition are not so good. So the algorithm takes a net uh, for a pedestrian. So in this case, it cannot be so dangerous as a situation, but I can have a problem of comfort because for example, if the detection is flickering, I can have the car that is braking and accelerating and then braking and accelerating. So this is, uh, it's, a very, it's a problem of very discomfort for the user. So the last, uh, picture is the one that uh, we want to have, but uh, that it's not possible to have all the time. So finally, it's uh, a problem about safety versus comfort. So we have to manage all these things. So the extension that I'm under development are, uh, first of all, try to uh, change the algorithm. So image processing activities are going very fast in these years. So we have uh, find uh, some new algorithm that seems uh, uh, better than the one that we have used since now. And then thanks to the stereo camera, we can also measure the distances. So we can uh, try to understand better where the position of the pedestrian is. So we here we, can we have to understand how much accuracy we can achieve. For example, if we can have a lane level accuracy or more, this because our final goal is to do pedestrian tracking. And so 
here we have to understand what about computation requirements. So if a GPU is enough to do all the things that you want to do, for example, where we have four or five people crossing a street. And then we have also to understand if we need the non-standard messages to send all this information to the autonomous vehicle. Okay, the third one is the connected bicycle. Here, uh, the use cases is uh, the fallen bicycle. So we want to detect if the bicycle is falling and then send the messages to the car. As you can see, here we have another type of IoT platform. This because uh, in this case, we need to uh, power this platform with a battery. So we need something uh, uh, a little bit uh, uh, with less consumption that the onboard unit that we have on the vehicle. And here, in order to understand if the bicycle is fallen, we use an inertial measurement units uh, integrated in a GPS, and we use the raw values of uh, its accelerometers to detect the fall. And then, thank you to the HCG5 module, we can trigger the sending of a DNM message. And uh, it's also important to say that our bicycle can also send CAM messages exactly as a vehicle. And here we have chosen uh, the inertial unit also because in this way we can feed the fields about uh, the vehicle dynamic that in this case uh, is not a vehicle, but is a bicycle. Okay, the last uh, components is uh, the potholic detector. So here uh, we have tried uh, to use uh, a virtual sensor concept. So we know, we all know that today all the vehicles are increasingly equipped with different type of sensor. And uh, uh, we think that combining data from different sensor or for from different sensors, but uh, of the same time, we can improve the accuracy and the reliability of sensor data, but we can also create a sensor that bridge what can be measured from the, to what developer want to detect, leveraging sensor fusion techniques. So our virtual portal sensor it's composed by three different accelerometer. So one using the accelerometer that are inside a smartphone and that can be sent, uh, the information can be sent via Wi-Fi. The second one is a vibration sensor that exchange data using the six low Bupan channel. And this is provided by CNIT. And then the third one is inertial measurement unit uh, provided by CRF. So the current implementation of the algorithm is based only on the smartphone data, but we are working to integrate also the other two sensors. And the, here you can see how it works. So we have the three different sensors, the data are combined and sent uh, through MQTT to our IoT onboard unit. Here you can see some example of real data collected on field during the next, uh, the, the last campaign in Livorno. Then uh, thank you to this data, we can understand if uh, there is a pothole. And so we are sending this information to the one M2M platform in a crowdsourced way. So their services can do, can use in a smart way this data, for example, uh, sending notification to other vehicles in that area in order to avoid, to let them avoid possible potholes. So here you can see the team that has developed all the things that uh, I have described. It. And so thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Daniele. Uh, so now I open the floor to questions and answers. Uh, please use uh, the chat box uh, to send uh, questions uh, to the experts that who have uh, presented uh, their slides. Um, is there any question from the audience?
Okay, uh, I have a question actually. So, in order to let you not to be shy, I start first, uh, and uh, uh, Leandro, from uh, the perspective of the uh, car maker, uh, in the how to say general strategy of the car makers, uh, what is uh, Auto, the autopilot project providing you, which kind of uh, uh, perception of the state of the art, uh, the uh, interest of uh, gathering information from an IoT platform, uh, the uh, real, how uh, to say, extension of the uh, electronic horizon of the vehicle. How can these, how to say, new inputs are considered by the car makers? Uh, okay, thanks Paolo for the question. Mm, I'll try to give you a general uh, answer, uh, not of course based on uh, the FCA strategy, of course. So uh, from our point of view as a maker, uh, the idea of having information coming from outside, from IoT, from uh, the cloud and so on, is of course uh, of interest for us. Uh, but uh, because it gives us the possibility to, um, how to say, to enhance uh, the perception of the vehicle and uh, to expand also the safety limit of the vehicle itself. Uh, because thanks to, to the communication, of course, we are able to extend uh, the, the range of in vehicle sensors that usually uh, are limited to a few hundreds of meters in that case. But uh, on the other side, we need to be careful about using information coming uh, from the communication because uh, for, as you know better than me, each, uh, let's say, telecommunication system cannot be validated from a safety point of view. Or in particular, if we talk about functional safety, any system that is based on uh, just communication cannot be, let's say, certified in an easy way. And that is the reason why uh, usually we, we try to, let's say, to fuse the information coming from outside with the information which is available uh, uh, which is already available in the vehicle. So the target, from my point of view, is that the data fusion of uh, information coming from outside and the information acquired by vehicle sensors. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, another question uh, uh, is, uh, if is there any... Ah, there is one uh, raised from uh, Giovanna Larini. Okay. So, Giovanna, can, uh, can you ask me a question or to anybody? Giovanna? Giovanna, did you raise uh, the arm for uh, asking questions? Okay, so uh, I, I try to go ahead, uh, ask another question to Lorenzo Pieri, if he's still there. Lorenzo, are you there? Yes, yes, I'm still here. Yeah, what, what is the benefit of uh, including uh, the uh, data node into the control loop of this uh, cooperative, extended <laughs> IoT-based cooperative ITS? Well, thank you very much for the question, Paolo, and I will answer gladly. Um, as I have said previously, the Datex 2 is um, European standard for the for the roads, for the highways, and it is um, a well-known and used standard in this um, in this cooperative environment, which means that the possibilities are really um, really big, and there are a lot of uh, there are already a lot of experts that can work side by side in this kind of environment, bringing forth um, the state of the art that this uh, research is looking for. So I think Datex2 protocol, uh, which is highly standardized and also went under renovation just a few weeks ago, is really the go-to protocol for this kind of uh, cooperative environment with the exchange of uh, uh, road informations. Thank you. Actually, uh, I would say myself a remark on this uh, new feature of the 
autopilot uh, test site in Italy, uh, that of uh, extending uh, the uh, the scope of the traffic control center to the cooperative ITS uh, permits a pervasive uh, capabilities capability of detecting events. And uh, so events uh, are not reported by humans uh, by calling uh, the, uh, the, the control center it, itself, but machine-to-machine uh, -machine by the devices. This is uh, some good insight into the IoT uh, realm, into the IoT challenge. Uh, and uh, especially in the in the domain of intelligent transport system, this will provide a real, uh, to say, good uh, feature of uh, feeling uh, the perception of events that are uh, happening in real time, far from our, uh, from the capabilities of sensing of, of board devices, and also. Uh, from the capabilities of uh, fog communication, uh, let's say medium access layer communication that is provided by ETCG5. Okay, I don't know whether are there other questions. I ask uh, Cecilia to help me. <laughs> How much uh, does this Q and A session uh, last? Hi, hello. Unfortunately, no. We don't have any other questions. Uh, so I think we can uh, close the the, the webinar and uh, thank all the participants uh, for attending. Yeah, uh, my, my only final remark is that uh, a two-day event is uh, approaching now in Livorno. Uh, there will be a dedicated uh, day for stakeholders uh, for exploiting the results of the project on October 18. Uh, and there will be a public demonstration of the technologies we have developed so far uh, the day after on the 19th. Uh, so if you are interested uh, into these uh, topics, please uh, drop me an email and I will reply. Thank you so much for uh, your participation.